So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Tedora Furtan, and I'm going to talk to you about my most recent project, which is called Generative Dreaming. And um, I'm also do I'm also going to do a short demo towards the end. Um, so, to tell you a little bit about the project, so this project sort of sets out to explore the dream as both production material and abstract representation. Um, it's taking its cues from the surrealist fascination with what was deemed as life's other 50%. Um, and it's an ongoing series that approaches dreaming not as a gap in consciousness, but as the other pole of mental activity, existing in a fragmentary state of remembrance after its conclusion. And ultimately, it aims to rework this base material through literary and generative visual approaches. Um, so the project itself is a collection of recorded dreams over a period of one month, which is passed through a Markov chain text generator in order to investigate the potential of producing new fictions from these recollections of the whimsical that are already modified by fluctuations of uh, sort of my own archival memory. Um, so the text, uh, the base text is reprocessed in order to create generative dreams, and uh, the resulting generative texts are then interpreted through a custom text analysis software based on numerology, the results of which are then utilized as anchor points for generating abstract visual landscapes of these sort of fragments of the subliminal. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit of kind of what's under the hood before showing you um, a demo of the project. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little about generating text with engrams. Um, in, my, so in my previous explorations of generative literature, I found Markov chain models, or engram models as they're called, um, to be the most successful at creating output text that comes as close to coherent fiction as possible. Um, so what the Markov chain algorithm does um, is it uses the input text to form word dependencies without the knowledge of the language syntax or semantics. Uh, but solely based on the statistical knowledge extracted from the text corpus. Um, so basically, it predicts the outcome of an event given, uh, given only the previous state, which here is the previous word, and this gives rise to some very interesting results in terms of the output text. And a little bit of the, about this analysis by numerology. Um, so following this idea that numerology as an ancient sort of divinatory art can draw cosmic meaning and purpose, um, I decided to create sort of visual microcosms for these dreams. Um, based on this practice of extracting and interpreting numerical values from words. Um, so the, the generated text is divided into parts of speech and the letters of each word are assigned a certain number and um, converted into digits and the digits are added in between themselves and each word um, kind of ends up having a value in between one and nine. Um, so different part of speech values are then used to drive a different aspect of the visuals. So here are some samples of the sort of generated um, pictorial language. So the adjectives sort of affect the color, the nouns affect the movement, the positioning, and the symbolism in these shapes, and the verbs affect the movement because they are rendered through an animation, as I'm gonna show you very shortly. Um, and this is a text sample of the generated text, um, so I'm just gonna read it out to you. So many hours go by as I can still make them out, but long winding monologues about matter, fire, and transcendence, but no time to waste. I walk past with the knowledge that I ran my fingers across when I was a child. Sound is real though, or I think it is. There is no end and no beginning. And a very short demo of how the visuals are rendered. Um, so this is sort of corresponding to the text that I've just read out to you. That's it, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Nathan. Um, uh, I've just done some work recently called uh, Dubrovnik Ghost Series. Dubrovnik Ghost Series is an exploration into the nature of neural networks as a medium through which to tell personal stories. The work takes the form of a deconstructed documentary, a visual essay, which employs computational experimentation as core source material. A lot of the contemporary work around neural network image making has emphasized fidelity, and we're seeing the results gaining media attention with deep fakes, uh, and most recently Chinese app Zhao being two examples that have um, come into the public consciousness. At the same time, there hasn't been much of a reflective discourse around the technology beyond the obvious effect of faked imagery on notions of truth. But what else can these networks offer? I wanted to explore this and at the same time highlight the materiality of the underlying technology, that is, provide some insight 
into how this technology works and foreground the most crucial aspect of it, which is the providence of the data set. Most GANs are, are generative adversarial networks, which are one of the main technologies that run deep fakes and lots of the stuff that you've been seeing in, in the media. Uh, they're trained on huge standardized data sets, and we've already heard about some of the problematic nature uh, of relying on standard uh, data sets. Um, these are comprised of millions of images, but what would happen if you trained a network on a very small data set, but the data was uniquely personal to you? Would it provide you with insights, possibly catharsis? The small data set uh, I had access to was an archive of my father's landscape paintings, and the archive formed the story which I tell in the film. My father was an amateur landscape painter. Some of my earliest memories were of him and I out in the Australian bush, drawing and painting the latest river, tree, or dusty path. In 2016, he passed away after a long illness, and the complications toward the end of his life prevented us from taking a final painting trip together. Years later, during this research process, I realized that the archive of my father's paintings might give me the chance to go on a final road trip with him again. Using a GAN, a pix to pix which is a standard one that is often used in this sort of uh, uh, circumstance, I created a model, a, a ghost of his creative spirit, based on these images, and then traveled with him to Dubrovnik, Croatia, where we collaborated to produce a new series of images. I would sketch the images, and he would paint them. Through the process, I've come to regard neural networks as diffractive in the haraway Barad sense, that is, the model provides a repository of disparate moments in time, space-time matterings, that may be accessed and reconfigured into new patterns. In this work, the reconfigurations provide a speculative insight into the road trip untaken, while also demonstrating how the technology that underpins the tectonics of our modern world may be able to, may be able to empower an individual to craft new stories and experiences. Thank you. Hello. Um, I will play back the video documentation of my video in Fast Forward, and I will talk on top. Um, I am Irini, I'm a dance artist, and it's been only the last year that I've been working with technology while I'm trying to develop my choreographic practice um, through a broader human and non-human scope. Uh, the reason I, I am doing this transition from traditional human-centered choreography to to computational choreographies because I, I had a severe injury uh, which affected me as an artist who works with her own body. Uh, and through technology, I'm trying to, to liberate myself and my practice from the restrictions of the human body. So about my, my project uh, within the Vibrant Assemblage, uh, it is a performance of human and non-human participants who serve a particular degree of dance uh, aptitude and dance uh, endurance. This is what I call uh, dance power, and this is what I perceive as the vibrancy, the, um, uh, the liveliness, the effective capacity that uh, vibrant matter has, the way that the theorist Janet Bennett uh, describes it. Um, so what I did was that I tried to generate this dance power, and I, I used five and a half hours uh, of uh, improvisational dance by 11 dancers, collaborators, uh, which I tracked with a Kinect. Uh, and I used this uh, training data set to generate new sequences of movement. So my input were, was um, numerical values, coordinates, uh, um, X, Y, Z coordinates of body joints in space. Um, and I generated new coordinates in space, uh, from numbers to numbers. And the fact that my output was numbers uh, made me feel that I have the freedom to reinterpret them and transfigure them in whichever materiality I could imagine. So uh, I ended up, uh, um, the generated values ended up being embodied by a mobile configuration of, uh, um, of motors, of pixels, and of a human presence in space. Um, the vibrant assemblage. So the motors uh, uh, correspond to, to these motorized objects that you might have seen, which move very discreet, discreetly, and their moving behavior uh, is mapped to the Z values of, uh, of seven body joints. Um, 
Then there are the, the pixels, which correspond to the projected uh, visuals, uh, that try to have a narrative, a gradual narrative from the raw, the, the raw data, the numbers to single body joints, and then to the humanoids, the skeleton figures. And then there is the human presence, uh, which is apparently the human um, existing, uh, improvising in space in a responsive way, not in a descriptive way of action-reaction, um, because it was all about um, being aware of this dance power that exists, uh, that circulates around and within possible and actual bodies. That was it. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jeremy, and uh, I come from a literary background, so artificial it or ça artificiel, because it's a French and English uh, bilingual project, is um, a project of writing and um, you could say computational literature, and that it has its grounds in a long-term um, writing practice, which has, um, which has formed the corpus that has been used in order to produce new texts. So the idea is rather simple, actually. It's a cycle where you have, first, a source corpus. So that would be data. And in this case, it's uh, a, a number of texts that I've written over the years that I then feed into, yet again, one of these LSTMs, um, which then can produce something like some an alterate, um, altered version of my own self. It's a bit like a, a weird creative doppelganger where I can see the patterns and habits that I have myself when writing, but in a uh, strange, deformed or hallucinating way. And once I have this, uh, the interesting next step, which is not necessarily um, a given, is that I chose to, to consider them as my own texts. So instead of focusing only on, say, the technical aspects of the architecture, which is still uh, on, the, on the table, I would love to be able to <clears throat> develop or work with more advanced technology. At this stage, especially with the long form, these networks tend to produce very, um, some very magmatic, uh, formless, streams of, of words and language. And so I thought that it would be interesting to use that as a constraint and say, okay, what if, I, what if it was I who had written that? And why, what would I do with those texts and how would I transform them in order to you know, be able to say those are mine and I can endorse uh, these as an artistic product? And so ideally, in the last stage, that's more of a future prospect, I would then take these texts and then feed them again into the, the network so that you would have, again, this shift where the network learns, uh, on, like, learns the, the characteristics of these new texts. So uh, first, I will show two, <coughs> two examples. One that I called logisms, uh, just a shortening of neologisms, is where you feed the network just a a dictionary, and you can create really, really easily new English words um, because this uh, network basically learns what is the next letter coming after another and having based itself on a, a list of, a large list of, of English words. Uh, and then um, those examples are just short sentences or slogans that emerge from this magma. Uh, and you can notice that because the network works at a letter level, uh, the words are not fixed. So demolist, for instance, appears as some sort of neologism that you can reuse. And my goal is then to, oh, oh, I see. OK, there was another slide that got lost. Anyway, I, would, I also have prose texts, and I would like to be able to work on them and develop them as if to mirror the, the sort of monologues that I've been producing uh, previously. And uh, the, the great challenge uh, and the great opportunity is to be able to 
to expand this form so that it is possible for a network to produce a text that has a more, like, as it were, a consciousness of the past and or a vision of the future. Because what we see in the practice of training these neural networks is that the local level can be really well mastered. And the LSTM actually was a big revolution because it allowed the networks to remember what had happened further back in the text and therefore having, um, as, if, as it were, more options and more intelligence in the way it would predict or try and you know, produce the, the, the next letters or the next words. And so that would be the, the that's the direction that I'm headed so that um, I like to create more of these texts and uh, be transformed, as it were, by these doppel neural doppelgangers. Thank you very much. So, do we have any questions for any of these four artists? Impressive projects. They were uh, in a degree show just a few weeks ago, so they're very, very fresh. And Brilliant um, work and fantastic projects. Thank you all very much. That was super interesting. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out um, how to um, ask one question for all of you. <laughs> um, and maybe for some it's more relevant than others, but I think um, all of you are, are kind of working and dealing within this aesthetic dimension. Um, and it's, uh, I'm interested in how this aesthetic encounter, which is something that I, I mentioned earlier as well, um, is pr productive of, of knowledge. And how, uh, um, I guess, what kind of other real, what kind of, in your case, dreaming is, is very much about producing reality or... Uh, Right, or being within within the, within the real is not, it, but a different kind of real. So I'm interested in how this aesthetic encounter, and in or in especially in your case as well with the dancing, in your case with the pen, painting, um, this other side of the real that the aesthetic maybe has access to. I don't know if you've thought about that. Um, yeah, I'd say that for me, it's a really, really sort of important aspect, um, especially because I have a background in painting. So this kind of idea of aesthetics and this kind of visual encounter for me has to be, as you said, productive of knowledge. So I guess one thing that I was trying to achieve with this, these kind of abstract um, images is to create this sort of like symbolism where people can perhaps see more there. And in the same way with texts, I'm very interested in this idea of producing knowledge through sort of aesthetic means. So that was, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think with the piece that I created, the, the actual sort of end result, the artifact, is a, is a film. It's a process film. And the, the, the point of the work and the knowledge I'm trying to almost make visual is um, I'm almost trying to introduce like a layperson to this technology through, through, the, de through the application of it. Um, I'm, for people who have been following this sort of neural network, machine learning, and I've only been learning about it for the last sort of 12 to 18 months, so I'm still basically learning as I go. Um, the technologies I'm actually using are not revolutionary at all. You know, they've been long superseded, but that's not really the, the point of what m my piece is about. It's sort of more about just, just making the, the process visible. And also, uh, I'm, I'm interested, in, uh, it's come up a few times, uh, the, the, the idea of small data. Obviously, we're all very aware of the provenance of data and that's you know, there's inherent biases and it can all go wrong when the data set isn't correctly sort of calibrated. Um, and, and also, in sort of people have their own data sets privately. So um, if there's some way that they can leverage their own data in, in using the technology that was invented by Google and huge corporations, but just on an individual level, um, I sort of, it's almost a speculative sort of utopian vision, which is, um, I guess what I'm trying to achieve with it. Yes, yes. Um, I try to 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 escape um, the control over the visual coherence of what I created, so because I'm I was mostly concerned on the um, on the moving behaviors of all the the participants of this event, so. Um, I would say that my aesthetic choices were mostly made regarding these moving behaviors. 
and I ended up curating many of the computer-generated uh, results. Whenever I didn't like something, I would retrain it or change my data set slightly. <laughs> I couldn't escape that, although I wanted to, to be more collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is what I mostly did. Yeah, I can, I can agree ab about the, the knowledge aspect for sure, let alone just learning how all these things work. But the interesting thing when using personal data is that you definitely see things that it's all, almost as if the, the machine was picking up on your most obvious traits slash flaws. And so suddenly between that and unheard of uh, suggestions, then there is a, this really interesting uh, back and forth where you're being transformed by, by that practice, for sure. It's just really interesting that I, I'm kind of seeing a resonance, uh, a really odd resonance between all these AI techniques and the way that you use them as artists, almost in the same way that people like Max Ernst and others would use um, dreams, automatic writing, and B.S. Johnson used cut-up techniques to come up with new meanings. And it seems like you're using AI not as a means to replace yourselves, but as a kind of tool that then you can bounce off and then maybe even feed in again and then come up with something really amazing uh, and original. Would you say that's true? Well, definitely there's, the, there's that aspect. And someone today already mentioned the idea of... Uh, I can't remember if it was artificial or mechanical uh, imagination, but there is definitely this idea, and uh, I can relate also to the the constraints and techniques. And for me, I would look to the Ulipo in France, for instance, as a as an interesting uh, another example of of this, where uh, you you use a system to foster something within you and to get you off track or push push you in another direction. We need more mics. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, in like my background is in animation and, and filmmaking, and I've been trying to sort of understand the difference between what, like, why use a neural network to do something. There are so many other ways of doing it. You could, you could, you know, in, in creating a film or an image, you could do a collage. You could do a. There's lots of ways of doing it. And the thing that I've sort of come back to is. And we talked about agency or, you know, is, is it an AI? Is it just a very smart algorithm? And I don't necessarily have an answer, but I, I do agree with the uh, previous speaker who was saying it's sort of like a collaborator, um, as in it's, it's unpredictable, but it's familiar. Um, and in a way, it, 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 and that's why I, I was saying it's like a diffractive sort of medium. It's, it's, a, it's a medium which is not a straight reflection of what you put into it, of the data set. Um, there is a, a, a slight othering, there's a slight alien sort of distance, but yet familiarity, which is really uh, sort of captivating. And I think across all of the work that we've been doing, whether it's, you know, bio, like motion data or, or text data or image data, there's this, there's this sort of, it's sort of sitting in the un uncanny valley in a way that not many other mediums kind of do, which I think is why we're so interested in it. Um, yeah, so for me, this idea of sort of creating computational tools, um, as you called it, um, it was actually the topic of a larger research project. So sort of the topic of my dissertation was looking at creating these sort of computational thought tools that kind of serve as a sort of technological reinterpretation of these ideas of the cut-up technique and so things like the exquisite corpse game and uh, action drawing and... Um, yeah, things used by the Dadaists and the Surrealists, and a lot of my research is around this kind of idea of using computation instead of sort of physical randomness um, to kind of glean new meaning out of these things. Um, so it's quite interesting to bring this into question, but I guess um, this sort of idea of mechanical imagination, like Jeremy called it, is quite central in my own practice, and I do think there is a lot of room left for sort of exploring what the computer can do for us in this sense and how it can perhaps even go beyond our sort of own kind of controlled thinking mechanisms. Um, so, yeah. Oh. 
for me, it was uh, the reason, uh, the way I started my presentation was about my injury, because that was the initial uh, uh, motivation for me to turn into technology, uh, because I lost one of the main uh, tools I had and powers, so I needed to, to find something that could, I don't know if it could replace it, but maybe expand it towards a different direction. And this is what I found in, in machine learning. I feel that I gained a power that I didn't have. I don't know if I use it uh, in, in the maximum of its potential yet, but I feel that I'm receiving things that I, were missing from, from my practice so far. Last question for uh, artists. Yeah, I was uh, I was kind of struck by how personal this was for all of you, um, and really I'm kind of interested in the idea that that your curation of the results of the output that you generated was actually part of the story, and uh, I don't know. It really kind of um, it made me think that the art is now with AI, maybe about how you curate what is generated and how you present your curation of it and your opinion of it. And maybe maybe it was very challenging for you to see some of this, you talked about that, how it presents back some very obvious traits. Like how how did you manage to curate the work that was uh, that was output from your, your algorithms? Um, so I guess you bring like quite an interesting point into discussion here because um, I don't know, at least for me and my own practice, I do not kind of want to relinquish all control to the machine. So I still want sort of my own agency as an artist. And I sort of see this coming out as like an act of curation and kind of handpicking and deciding what of this I want to show. Um, but there were definitely surprising moments for me, especially with like the text generation. Um, but I do see this element of curation as kind of a very important aspect and also kind of pertaining to the personal as well. Because again, it's kind of how we define ourselves as artists that influences what we choose to show and the way we choose to show it in. Um, so I do think it's a very, very important aspect to keep in mind. Um, in my theory research uh, this year, I was uh, trying to suggest a new practice, a new choreographic practice, which was called uh, being in a choreo milieu, um, which actually was about uh, questioning the authorship of the human creator uh, and trying to, to share the space uh, without taking the leadership on, on, on creating this, whatever you create, with the machine. Um, so my, initially, I didn't want to curate anything. Uh, I wanted to be in this choreo milieu and whatever the machine produces, that would be my output. But the truth is that I, so far I couldn't escape this need to control over what I'm creating. But this is a challenge and a question that I keep asking myself and I'm quite disappointed in myself whenever I, 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 I curate <laughs> my output. Um, yeah, th I th that's a really interesting question. I think for for me, the um, the because it was coming, all of the output was coming from a like a very sort of personal curated data set. And I guess I say curated; it's literally just all, all of the pictures that were there, you know. So that was, I guess, an aspect that wasn't curated. Um, but then, so so in a way, all of the results that came out of it, I, I did sort of select particular images, say ones where there was more fidelity, going back to the, you know, does this look like anything or does this not? But I think also because I was framing the work as a collaboration all along, so for me it was, you know, I, I did kind of mythologize it and sort of anthropomorphize it. I, you know, I literally, while we were in Dubrovnik, I was saying, we're going sketching. Like, that was always part of the the way I was sort of working. So in that respect, it was a comfortable sort of back and forth between me and this sort of, you know, spectral presence. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I actually like the, the fact that there are inherent glitches and sort of, and sort of problems and, and imperfections in, in, you know, it's sort of the crackle and the grain to use a sort of hauntology sort of, um, uh, aspect, you know, it's 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 sort of got this this texture to it that that reminds you that um, it's been through a process, and you know, you didn't tell it exactly what to do. But I think definitely, like artist curation is at still at the moment. It, it I can't um, imagine sort of doing this and 
well, actually, my, the work I'm doing at the moment is is trying to go through an unsupervised sort of process, doing the same thing and just seeing what comes out. And at the moment, I'm struggling <laughs> because the results are, are you know, they're, they're very challenging and, and they don't necessarily, because something I'm very interested in is ex sort of explaining this technology to people who don't necessarily know how it works when it affects their lives. So I almost want it to be alien, but I don't want to just show someone sort of like a mistake and then go, because it's almost too much, but anyway. It's a mistake, I don't know. <clears throat> oh, uh, thanks for the, that, that question. I will try and be brief-ish. Um, but it's interesting what you were saying about curation, because for instance, uh, in, in the case of uh, this text generation that I was experimenting with, actually the smallest level, so for instance, if I uh, feed in a dictionary and create words, then indeed the my role is reduced to a curator, because the words are really well-formed, and apart from a few exceptions, it's really about me picking um, the ones that are nice and that, that I like. Actually, I have a demo of that later. And the interesting thing is that because I wanted to have longer text, including prose text, and that uh, because that was the, the scale at which the, the network was actually not working that well, that implied that I, if I wanted the type of texts uh, or text that I could endorse in whatever way, I would have to put in a lot of work. So it's interesting to see that in that case, uh, there is a lot of preparatory work to create the corpus, and then there's just this cut by the network, and then you have this thing produced that you have to, to transform. And in fact, I found that this practice was much harder than just writing with a blank page. So it was, it was like almost the, uh, the chore of having to transform something which is almost like gibberish into something that could uh, be aesthetically uh, interesting. Thank you.